Hey guys, welcome back. Ashley D. Will here. I hope everyone is doing well. Today I'm starting a five-part lesson on spiritual growth in Jesus Christ. There are many ways to grow and there are many lessons that we hear out there, but there is one best way to grow and that is by listening and following the Holy Spirit while you read and pray to have a heart to believe God's Word. Also joining with other authentic believers who can encourage you helps greatly. So spiritual growth in Christ is a wonderful experience. It is an adventure and I want your growth in Christ to be all that it can be in this life. Once you cross the river and you're in eternity, that is a different segment. But this segment, while we're on this earth, in these bodies, trying to figure everything out, I want you to have the maximum experiential reality of what Christ has purchased for you and given to you in your inheritance, in his salvation. So let's look at this illustration. A little bit busy, but I think we can get through it. So over here to the left, we have a dark gray triangle. And it is moving from massive, because it keeps going all the way back, and it's coming in here to be smaller and smaller. So it's coming to a point. And so this is sin, this dark area here. Sin is very real. It has power. It is extremely deceptive. And it can cause a lot of major problems in your life, in your heart, in your relationships, blockages between you and the Lord. And so this is why Christ died for us and why he rose again. Because human beings weren't originally designed to deal with sin. That's the problem. Is that it's not in our design and in our purpose for being here to deal with sin. But because Christ came and died for us and rose again, and he lives every moment to intercede for us, that is how we can navigate through this life. Moving from sin to other better places. But we all start out here, born in sin. Sin is dark. It's very dark. Sin comes alive and animates itself through the law. Sin is all about lies, believing lies, and the more lies that we believe, the more tangled up we get. Sin is also slavery. We don't realize it when we're in sin, but we really do have chains binding us. And we don't know any better because that's how it's always been for us. We were born that way, so we think it's normal. So that is a little bit about sin. Here we are over here in this dark, shadowy place. Jesus said in John 8, 24, If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. So we, staying here, will die in our sins, right? In this dark, dark place. And the only way that we can get out of this dark place is just as Jesus said. If we believe that I am he. When we believe, believe in, trust in, adhere to, and rely on the fact that Jesus Christ says that he is the Messiah and we place all of our eggs in his basket and trust him and him alone to save us, that belief is the key that unlocks the door to the faith we need to be counted as righteous. So it all starts with believing. And in your salvation, God gives you faith. He puts a little mustard seed of faith in your heart. And if you can connect with that, you will start to believe. And the more you believe and the more you focus on it, ask, seek, and knock, 
pursue him, run after him with your whole heart in believing him, the more you will begin to see reality. So believing is a key word, very, very important word. Down here, next to sin, we have another quote from Jesus Christ, and we find that in John 6, 29. Jesus answered some questions, and one of the questions was, what can we do to be like you? You're doing the work of God, and we're so impressed, but what can we do to be like you, to follow you? And Jesus answered them, and he said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So here's that word again, believe. That is a deep, powerful word. And it's all about the heart. So when you fill your heart with belief more and more, one drop at a time over the weeks, months, and years of your life, you will grow in automatically doing the work of God. Because the work of God is to believe. So if you focus on your heart and on believing more and more, little at a time, you are doing the work of God. That is the work of God. In fact, that is such powerful work of God to believe. We know that the fruit of belief, what is the fruit of belief? It is transformation. That's how we know that this verse is very, very serious, and this one as well. Not just because it's in the scripture, that's reason enough, but when we apply it to our lives and we do what it says and we give it time and focus and energy, our lives start to bear fruit. And that fruit of belief is a transformed heart, which results in a transformed mind and a transformed life, and transformed relationships, and transformed perception of reality. So this is very powerful material. The Word of God is active. It is alive. It is not just words on the page. When you eat it like food, and drink it like water, and breathe it like air, you are causing supernatural transformation to happen within you. You may not see it, because it happens slowly over time, but those around you take note. They definitely notice. They see you more objectively than you do, and they can tell. So be encouraged that the Holy Spirit is working in you. Another point we want to look at is this circle here. It's a cycle of going around and around, and it's repeating the same things and never really getting anywhere. It's kind of wasted effort because it doesn't bear any good fruit. So it's easy to get caught in these cycles and circles of defeat and circles of repeated actions that bear no fruit. And so I want to help you with that because I want to let you know that your enemy Satan is very real he is an extremely clever, evil genius. And he is the one who will lead you and drive you into these cycles that are a waste of time. Up here it says, your enemy Satan wants you wasting your life, your space, your time, your energy, trying to rid yourself of your own sins. Why would he do that? He's so clever and such a genius. Why would he do that? Well, he's a genius because he wants you wasting your time there doing something that is completely redundant. Why? Because Christ has already removed your sins for you. And he doesn't want you to know that. See, if he can keep you from this truth that Christ has already removed your sins for you, he can block this out, then he can keep you in this cycle of going around and around and around and falling in this pit 
and never able to get out because when we do this, we're ignorant of what Christ has done for us. And a lot of times we just get dizzy going around and around and we're really not getting anywhere. So it's like a big truck that is trying to get out of a ditch, but the ditch is all muddy. And the more the truck tries to get out, the wheel spins faster and faster and mud is slinging everywhere. And the truck is actually digging his back tires deeper down into the mud. So what we need when we get caught in this cycle is we need a tow truck to come and pull us out of the ditch and help us to see that once we're out of the ditch that we don't need to go back there. But often it takes many years, even decades, for us to realize the depths of this truth and that we never ever have to go back to this ditch again. But sometimes parts of us just can't help it. They just want to go back to the ditch because maybe that's all they've ever known, those parts of us, when we were little and we felt like nobody cared. When we were little and we were all alone. When we were little and we were violated or abused or mistreated and no one was there to help us. Those wounded parts of us kind of want to gravitate back here because that's where they grew up and this feels familiar to them. So the more healing we get, the more we will have eyes to see that this is really not our home anymore. This is an old ditch that the Holy Spirit can pull us out of and bring us into a new place. But we have to first believe that he wants to do that. Then we have to believe that he will. Then we have to reach out and let him do it. And cooperate with him for as long as it takes to get out of that ditch and into a better place. And then we have to fortify ourselves in this new place and protect ourselves and station reminders and guards for us to protect us from falling back into that ditch because we know we have that tendency. So when you, over time, develop the mind of a warrior you will say once you're out of a dark place, especially if you've been in very dark places most of your life, once you find a glimmer of hope and light and you let the Holy Spirit pull you out, you will have the resolve and the determination to say, with God as my witness and God willing, I will never ever go back to that place again. Lord, teach me how to stand and live and operate in this new reality and give me red flags if anything is going to try to bump me back in that ditch. I don't want to go back. However, sometimes when we come out of a dark place and we're in a better place, there are other parts of us that are not very developed. And if those parts outweigh the part of us that has found the new way that we like better being out of the ditch, those unhealthy parts, unless they get healing, they're going to drag us back into the ditch, which is unfortunate, but it is a, actually a learning tool and a step to freedom because you're seeing what needs help. What part of me is still broken and is wanting to go back to this dark place? That will let you know where you need healing if you keep going back to the ditch. All right, so... Coming out of this dark ditch, the tow truck of the Holy Spirit can slowly over time pull us out of the ditch. And so this arrow here is indicating where the Holy Spirit is leading us out of the darkness into the light, out of the darkness into the light. This is the way the Holy Spirit leads always, okay? Your woundedness, your flesh, and your uh, enemy will maneuver to keep you coming back here. But don't be discouraged if you fall back here repeatedly even because that is part of the learning process. That's part of the learning curve of getting stronger and getting healed so you can stay out here in a better place. So 2 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that the Holy Spirit leads this way. 
the Holy Spirit is always leading us in the victorious procession in the train of the robe of the Lord Jesus Christ because we belong to him. We still belong to him every time we fall back into this ditch. We still belong to him. We're just getting stronger and getting healed to be able to eventually stay on this pathway, this path of righteousness, this straight and narrow path to heaven. So down here, we have the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, and we have come from this dark place, spinning around and around in the ditch, and we've moved slowly from this place of sin, of darkness, of the law, heavy over our heads and a dark shadow over us with shame and guilt and condemnation and the fear of death, surrounded by lies, souls packed with lies, slavery. We can't get out of our chains. So that is here in the dark. We come slowly as the Holy Spirit's leading us to just believe the Lord, one little mustard seed of faith. He leads us to believe. And slowly we come to the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. This is a different kingdom than this kingdom. This kingdom over here is the kingdom of darkness, and it is dark and heavy and miserable and full of self and pride and I'm going to build myself up and I'm so arrogant and I'm so full of myself and it's all about darkness and lies and hurting others and competing and trying to get ahead and fighting for everything and wounding others and being wounded by them. So we're coming out of this with this mustard seed of faith that God has planted in our heart for us to believe him and what he's done at Calvary. So the moment we believe, we have been transferred from this dark kingdom into this kingdom of light, which is very different. It's so different that at first we find it overwhelming. We're very uncomfortable. We can't believe that anyone would love us or want to bless us. So it can be very strange and uncomfortable. But this is the kingdom of light. And the longer you're in this kingdom, the longer your eyes adjust to the light and the more your soul falls in love with the light and the more light you want to penetrate your soul. You can't help it. Even if it's going to be uncomfortable or painful, you love the light so much that that doesn't even matter to you anymore. You just want light to fill up your soul. This kingdom of light is filled everywhere with the grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the grace of God. He's the gift of God to humanity. And so that is his grace, and it manifests in so many wonderful, surprising ways. This kingdom is also the kingdom of truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth in John 14, 6. So he is all about truth. Freedom is another thing that you will discover in this kingdom of light. It won't manifest really at first, but you will slowly experience it over time as you continue to work by believing and make your way with the help of the Holy Spirit out of this ditch here. You may have been here for 20 or 30 or 50 years and then you come out for just a minute and you fall back in and you come out again and you fall back in. And you come out again and you stay a little longer and then you fall back in. And then you make your way out again. You stay a little bit longer and you fall back in. So after time, you will fall back in, stay out maybe a long time and then fall back in briefly and then stay out a longer time and then fall back just for a minute. So you're always making this progress. But the freedom will manifest as you start to realize the vastness of the grace of God, the vastness and the power of the grace of God, and you agree with that and you internalize it and you apply it in your life when situations come along. So freedom comes slowly 
and it comes one little finger at a time, one little toe at a time, one little movement more than you had before at a time. Okay, so let's look up here. This is Romans 4, 5, talking about working versus trusting. The Levitical system was all about working and rituals and repetition. And so this verse is showing us that in the New Covenant, when we have both feet squarely in the New Covenant, it says, however, to the one, with both feet squarely in the New Covenant, who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith, the one who trusts, is credited to him as righteousness. See, their faith doesn't apply to those who work because those who work are not trusting in God, but they are trusting in themselves. So they do not get any credited righteousness because they are their own God and they are working to be good enough for God. And so that is opposed to those who know they could never live up to God's holy standards. They could never be perfect. And they're not trying to be perfect. They're just surrendering and humbly trusting God to give them faith as a mustard seed and that he will credit that faith as righteousness. So we can see here that this gift of righteousness that he has given us is a gift. It's nothing that we do. It's nothing that we strive to do. What we're really doing is we're coming back over here and we're believing. Believing is what we're doing when we trust God. See, we're trusting him to do what he says he's going to do. We're trusting him to be who he says he is. And we're trusting him to take care of us as he says he will. That is dependence. That is humility. That is trust. And God loves it when believers trust him. So we can see from this verse, Romans 4, 5, that exercising the faith that God has given you equals righteousness. Righteousness. So we have to understand that over here, when we were in the dark, the Lord planted a little seed of faith in us, a little mustard seed of faith to believe. That belief and that little seed is like a muscle, a teeny little muscle that is an infant and it's never been exercised. But if we can focus on it and exercise it and grow it stronger and stronger, that is how we exercise our faith. We can say, Lord, help me with my faith. My faith may be weak. My faith may be, I have atrophied or maybe it's never even been developed. Wherever you are in your faith, it's okay because all you have to do is say, Holy Spirit, teach me how to exercise my faith. A lot of the exercising of faith can be blocked by a spirit of fear or through different traumas we've, we've been through as children. And you can ask the Holy Spirit to help you with that, show you what's going on, and you can go back and clean that up. He can do it with you and for you. But all the things that are blocking this, you want removed is the point. So you're going to exercise that faith, and that little mustard seed of faith will grow to a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and it will maybe look kind of like the size of an acorn. And then it can grow bigger and bigger, and it can be a little shoot out of the ground of a little baby tree that's growing. And over time, that little tree will grow and will get strengthened and be nourished, and it will result in a huge oak tree of righteousness. So this is not anything to stress out about. It is nothing to freak out about. It's nothing to be afraid of or to 
be a heavy burden on you, but you want to invest your life in exercising faith. It is a, a choice of wisdom to invest in the kingdom. When you invest in yourself by exercising the faith that God's given you, you are investing in the kingdom because you are a believer in the kingdom and your heart is Christ's treasure. And he has put that mustard seed of faith in your heart. So when you agree with him and say, yes, I want to use this gift you've given me and grow it stronger with your help and with your leading, he is very excited about that. He loves it. So, and the more you do that, your faith will grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And as your faith grows bigger, guess what? The reality that you have been already made righteous in God's eyes will grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And so that is a wonderful gift, a wonderful experiential reality, which lines up with the Lord. And it definitely keeps you from falling back over here when you know that's not your home anymore and you know you are absolutely perfectly righteous in God's eyes because of what he has done. There's no need to go back to the ditch. You don't want to go back to the ditch. The ditch feels far away and foreign, like something that's not familiar anymore. So that is very exciting, this process here of exercising the faith getting everything out of the way that is blocking it or hindering it and then letting that faith grow and asking the Holy Spirit to minister to you as to how you can grow your faith and then seeing this fruit of righteousness in your life. You guys, this is, there is no amount of money that you could ever pay to equal the gift of righteousness. This is priceless. It is just unspeakable. It's unspeakable. And I pray that you would seek the Lord in his righteousness above everything else in your entire life. Everything. Because that is investing in eternity and investing in the kingdom. And you will reap what you sow in that, which is a wonderful thing. And so that is my prayer for you. Matthew 6.33 So let's look over here at this cross. The cross is the foundation of this whole kingdom of light here. And the cross is the destination that the Holy Spirit is leading you out of the ditch to the cross. And so the cross is going to be your focus. Jesus Christ is going to be your focus. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is your focus, and you're going to join him in that crucifixion. It is a beautiful, wonderful experience to be crucified because only in the crucified life are you victorious. Victorious. So this here is the timeless, victorious cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Here's the cross, and that's where you're being led. This is how the Holy Spirit leads you out of the dark into the light. When you first approach the cross, the cross is really here too, and that's how you get out. But I have this arrow here just to indicate that he's leading away from the darkness. And so when you approach the cross, it may look dark and shadowy on this side of it. There may be dark shadows still. But once you penetrate the cross through being united with Christ in his crucifixion, you can emerge from the back side of the cross out here where there is the glory. And we're going to get to that um, by the fifth slide that we go over. So Hebrews 9.14 talks about the blood of Christ and how powerful that is. Let's read it. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death 
so that we may serve the living God. So this verse is contrasting Jesus Christ and his perfect eternal sacrifice through his blood with the bulls and goats and calves that they used to sacrifice under the old covenant because the Lord did not enter through the blood of goats and calves and bulls, but he entered the Holy of Holies once for all by his own blood. And through that, he obtained eternal redemption for us. When they would slay the goats and the bulls and the ashes of the heifer were sprinkled on those who were ceremonially unclean, it sanctified them temporarily, but only on the outside. It was a temporary covering. It could never reach in to cleanse the heart, to cleanse the conscience. It was an out, a repeated outward cleansing and there is no comparison between that and the blood of Jesus. So this verse is saying that those sacrifices were temporary. They were merely an atonement. And they were only on the outside. They were an exterior cleaning. An outward cleaning. Contrasting with that, the blood of Christ is eternal. It is perfect. And it was through the eternal spirit that he offered himself unblemished to God. And that sacrifice, that one sacrifice for all men, for all sin, for all time, continually cleanses our hearts, cleanses our minds, cleanses our relationships and our consciences from acts that may lead to death so that we may serve the living God. So it's showing us that no matter what's going on in your life, the power of this blood here, contrasted with the animal blood, this is eternal. How is it eternal? Because Jesus Christ is alive and he's never going to die again. This blood is perfect. It was never contaminated by sin. Blood directly from heaven. Therein lies its power. The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences. So this is how you can have a continual cleansing of your conscience, of your body, of your heart, of everything through this blood, the power of this blood. It is still alive. It never dies. The blood of Christ never dies. It can't die. It's eternal and it is perfect. That means there was never any contamination of any type. So this is the way that we can serve the living God because he's taken care of the issue for us through his own blood. He's taken care of the issue of separation from him by his blood. He's taken care of the issue of condemnation for us by his blood. He's taken care of the issue of guilt when we feel guilty, he's taking care of it by his blood. See, this has already happened. So take this truth and apply it fast forward on the video of your life from now until you die. Because that is the reality of what Christ has done for you. He has set you free from the law of sin and death. That means he set you free from all sin for all time, he set you free from all guilt for all time. He set you free from all condemnation for all time. And he set you free from the fear of death and spiritual death. Although your body will die, you will drop it like a garment. When you are taken to heaven, you will get a brand new body in heaven. So of course we can look forward to that. But this is a huge, huge, huge deal, guys. The enemy does not want us to know this. And if we know it, he doesn't want us to believe it. And if we believe it, he doesn't want us to remember it. And if we remember it, he doesn't want us to apply it. And if we apply it, he doesn't want us to have resolve in that application. See, he's on it all the time because he knows the power. He knows the power of this blood. 
and it makes him shake and collapse in torment. That is how powerful this blood is. It is so powerful. It blows everything out of the water. There is no discussion. There is no argument. It silences every single mouth in the world. No one can speak. Everyone's on their face when they realize the power of this blood. So Hebrews chapter 9 is a wonderful chapter if you want to be extremely encouraged in your faith and have sparks shoot off the page and sparks shoot out of your ears when you read it. Ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and open the eyes of your heart to be able to receive what it is saying. It is incredibly powerful. So this is just a semi-brief look at spiritual growth in Christ. This is part one of five that I'll be doing. So I would love to answer any questions you may have. I pray that this has ministered to your heart and has given you a one more ray of light to take one baby step closer to the Lord and that your heart has grown to believe one baby step deeper in the Lord and what he has done for you and that your understanding of his overwhelming agape love for you has grown one little root deeper into your heart as well. Okay, so you guys have a blessed day and I'll see you next time.